Good morning. Welcome. I encourage you to grab your Bible, whether in printed form or digital form, and turn to Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 11. We're going to continue in this uh, new series that I'm uh, bringing, Learn to Thrive, Sermons on Handling Tough Times. In this uh, particular message, we're looking at um, road trip in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 11. Let's, um, let's read that verse. O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. Nehemiah rode a horse around the ruins of Jerusalem at night alone, and he took notes. When he got back, he made his report and he started the process of change. Nehemiah's journey changed his nation. Nehemiah found himself in the middle of difficult times. And while those around him were just surviving, he thrived. Maybe you're dealing with an important financial decision, possibly a career move. It might be you're considering plans for your future or you're faced with a medical decision or whether it's a good time to get married and start a family. These may not sound like tough times, but they are tough decisions. Tough times make decisions more important, too important to make a mistake. Going back to where Nehemiah heard the report from Jerusalem, let me share with you four steps of advice for handling tough times. First, commit to proceed slowly. Nehemiah chapter one and verse four reads, so it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. You must wait on the Lord. You must carefully study the situation and what needs to happen. Most importantly, you need to see how God is leading. And this counsel goes directly against our human tendencies. The instruction of God's word is for us to be silent and to do nothing at all. Luke chapter 14 verses 28 down to verse 30. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. In tough times, it's important to make the right moves. Don't rush into decisions. Instead, make carefully thought, thought out decisions. A study called the Obstacles to Growth Survey was done with over 20,000 Christians in 139 countries, yet mostly in America between the ages of 15 and 88. Analysts found that 40% of the Christians around the world said often or always rush from task to task. And about 60% answered that it is often or always true that the busyness of life gets in the way of developing my relationship with God. While busyness afflicts both men and women, 
the distraction from God was more likely to affect men than women. The bottom line is many Christians are stuck in busyness, which has a negative impact on their relationship with God. Too busy for God. In tough times, reading the Bible is more important than ever to gain wisdom, to experience encouragement. You need to make progress, but you need to proceed slowly and hear from God. In tough times, reading the Bible is, is important. Second, plan to pray continually. Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 tells us, And then the king said to me, What do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. At this point, Nehemiah wasn't proceeding slowly. He was past that point. He was past the, the fasting and the waiting and the listening to God. At this point, he was in the middle of a God moment. When you're nervous before the big presentation or the phone call or the visit or whatever it might be, pray. Before you proceed, as you proceed, pray. Clarity is needed in such times. Understanding is needed in such times. If you can't see the stars when all the lights of the city get in the way, you must get away from all that light and then look up. Your eyes grow accustomed to the night sky and you will see more stars than you ever imagined. Prayer is like that. In his book, Good Morning, Merry Sunshine, Chicago Tribune columnist Bob Green chronicles his infant daughter's first year of life. When little Amanda was crawling, he wrote, this is something I'm having trouble getting used to. I will be in bed reading a book or watching TV and I will look down at the foot of the bed and there will be Amanda's head staring back at me. Apparently, I become one of the objects that fascinate her. It's so strange, after months of having to go to her, now she's choosing to come to me. I don't know quite how to react. All I can figure is that she likes the idea of coming in and looking at me. She doesn't expect anything in return. I'll return her gaze and in a few minutes, she'll decide she wants to be back in the living room and off she'll crawl again. That's what we enjoy each time we worship God and experience his presence. Third, purpose to serve faithfully. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 11, the third part of it. I was the cup, the king, I was the king's cupbearer. Nehemiah's job was kind of like the Secret Service, charged to protect the president. Instead of jumping in front of a bullet, he tasted the wine to be sure an assassin hasn't tried to poison the king. He had a great excuse for why he couldn't rebuild Jerusalem. He was the cupbearer. But like anyone who is called by God to a significant task, the necessity of the moment came to the front. You must start where you are. You can't wait until someday in the future to get the job done because that day always seems to be just over the horizon. The sto this, this story was printed in Prey Magazine. I am a surgical assistant, the surgeon's right-hand man. At one point in my career, I lost my passion. 
I wanted a job with spiritual significance, and I prayed for that. Imagine my shock when God led me to a position in plastic surgery. Why would God want me in a hotbed of vanity? <clears throat> I wondered. During my quiet times, the Lord assured me that this was part of his plan and that I should wait upon his direction. So I obeyed, continuing to pray that the Lord would use me in this job. The first thing I heard him say when he started, when I started my new position was, gather and pray in my name. There were only a few Christians who worked in the plastic surgery department, but I started with them. I'm gonna start praying for our workplace each Monday, 15 minutes before we clock in, I told them. I'll be in operating room two, and I hope you'll join me. We met each week praying for our work, our colleagues, and our patients. Soon we were praying boldly for opportunities to witness. By the end of that year, God had answered many prayers, which included 10 friends who accepted Christ as their savior. God has blown me away with his answers, and he has given me a purpose far beyond patient care. He expanded my circle of influence by transferring me to the main surgery department, where I now rotate through all four surgery departments in the hospital campus. I have been able to start several prayer groups throughout the hospital. Each group focuses on inviting the Holy Spirit to move in their department. They encourage each other in Christ, pray for opportunities to witness, seek God's will, and ask that Christ be glorified in their work. I don't know if I'll always work in a surgery department caring for patients who are under anesthesia most of the time I'm with them. But since I realized that I could advance the kingdom of God through praying at work, I have found renewed passion for my job as well as for opportunities for ministry that it provides. And then fourth, choose to act decisively. Nehemiah chapter one, verse 11, but the second part of that verse, let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Nehemiah prayed, and then he had the opportunity and decided to seize the moment. Uh, look at uh, Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 9 with me. Nehemiah prayed and prayed, and it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore, the king said to me, why is your face sad? since you're not sick. This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? And then the king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, how long will your journey be, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I, will, and I, and I set him a time. Furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river, that they may permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, 
for the city wall and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. And then I went to the governors in the region beyond the river and gave them to the, them the king's letters. <clears throat> now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. Nehemiah was ready because he had spent time in fasting, in prayer, waiting on the Lord. When the opportunity came, Nehemiah went for it. He saw a crack in the door and was ready to go through it. The Chinese symbols for crisis are identical to those for opportunity. Literally, crisis is an opportunity riding the dangerous wind. Seizing the moment requires the perspective that every crisis is also an opportunity for success. In the area of faith, it can be a costly process. In a South African courtroom, a woman listened to police officers confess to the atrocities they had penetrated in the name of apartheid. Officer Vandenbroek acknowledged his responsibility in the death of her son. Along with others, he had shot her 18-year-old son at point-blank range. He and the others partied while they burned his body, turning it over and over in the fire until it was reduced to ashes. Eight years later, Vandenbroek and others arrived to seize her husband. A few hours later, Vandenbroek came to fetch the woman. He took her to a woodpile where her husband lay bound. She was forced to watch as they poured gasoline over his body and ignited the flames that consumed his body. The last words she heard her husband say were, forgive them. Now Vandenbroek stood before her awaiting judgment. Now Vandenbroek stood before her awaiting judgment. South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Committee, Commission asked her what she wanted. I want three things, she said calmly. I want Mr. Vandenbroek to take me to the place where they burned my husband's body. I would like to gather up the dust and give him a decent burial. Second, Mr. Vandenbroek took all my family away from me and I still have lots of love to give. Twice a month, I would like for him to come to the ghetto and spend a day with me so I can be a mother to him. Third, I would like Mr. Vandenbroek to know that he is forgiven by God and that I forgive him too. I would like someone to lead me to where he is seated so I can embrace him and he can know my forgiveness is real. As the elderly woman was led across the room, Vandenbroek fainted, completely overwhelmed. Someone began singing Amazing Grace. Gradually, everyone joined in. This woman understood that to be reconciled with God and to be reconciled with neighbors and enemies is to be free indeed. Tough times can be times of opportunity for God's kingdom. Commit to proceed slowly. Plan to pray continually and purpose to serve faithfully and choose to act decisively. When you find yourself in difficult circumstances, seize the moment and plan the road trip of ministry. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for all your goodness. Thank you that you call us, you prepare us, and you lead us into your works of ministry. Father, I pray that each one of us, each one listening or watching this message, 
that you would speak to each one of our hearts, that we would truly be committed to your ministry, that we would wait and become ready to hear your word and to respond in preparation and then be ready to follow your leadership, acting decisively to step into the ministry that you call us to. And Father, may you be glorified. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. And you have a great day.